Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into Your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for another opportunity that You've given us to come together and feast upon Your Word. I thank You, dear Father, for the, Your Holy Spirit, for the direction that He gives us in our lives, that He's our Comforter, that You're our Father. We give You all the glory, the honor, and the praise. I ask that You would filter out all of that which is not of You, not of the Holy Spirit, all of the foolishness and all of the ignorance, but seal to our hearts only that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, Steve here. Uh, in our Sunday morning studies, we're going through the first chapter uh, in second chapter of second corinthians verse by verse we've moved into the second chapter we're in chapter one and we were at verse 22 last week second uh, corinthians chapter one verse 22 we closed out our study a week ago looking at the attributes of the holy spirit uh, seeing uh, that, that it was crystal clear in the word of god that the holy spirit is god almighty uh, a third person of the uh, Trinity. We believe that there is one God. We worship one God and we see Him revealed in the Word uh, as the Eternal Father, Father, the Eternal Son, and the Eternal Holy Spirit. And we further found that, uh, that the work of the Holy Spirit is directly re related between God Almighty and ourselves. And now we're, we are told in the 22nd verse that He's not only sealed us, and uh, the idea in the Greek language there in the sealing is that He's taken the obligation that, uh, that he, and that he, he intends to fulfill it, that He's not only sealed us, but He's given us the earnest of the Holy Spirit. Uh, in our, and I pointed out how that in our, our use of earnest money today, we use it somewhat as a forfeiture, as a bond, as it were. We indicate that we intend to do something, and if we do not do it, then we forfeit the earnest money. Whereas in the Greek uh, mind and in culture, the earnest money was given as the down payment of a transaction that uh, was definitely going to be completed. We have His Word. Uh, we have Him beside us as a helper, uh, translated comforter uh, in the Gospel of John in the uh, authorized version. But the work of the Holy Spirit, it's really much more than just comfort. Uh, he's one who supplies all of the help that we need. Uh, we have the witness of the Holy Spirit. We have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We have, uh, we have the Holy Spirit identifying us uh, in the body of Christ, the sealing of the Spirit, the control of the Spirit, the intercession of the Spirit, and the perfection of the Spirit. And we have received not just His work, the work that He's given us, but we've received the Spirit Himself. Now, if that down payment if that's only an earnest, just imagine what the fulfillment might really be. The problem, of course, in the Christian life, uh, folks, is that there are so many desires, uh, so much materialism, that the earnest uh, seems to be dwarfed. There is no material possession on earth that could possibly put, be put in the same context with the earnest of the Spirit. If you've known anything at all of, the, of, of God's forgiveness by grace, uh, what believer could possibly compare any desire or possession uh, versus the peace of God that passes understanding, the love of God, the joy of God, which is, which is unspeakable, the assurance of our relationship with Him. Surely, an all-wise God has given us what we need, and surely it's evident that, for the most part at least, that it's not what we want. 
It is, however, what we have and what we need, and any earnest reflection would make it very, very clear that these are marvelous, marvelous concepts. What would you trade for that? It's a shame that so many Christians have never really entered into what they really have in Christ, their possessions in Christ, the earnest of the Spirit. Paul says in verse 23, I call God as a witness upon my very life. We're not looking here at the greatness of Paul, but the greatness of God. Paul is not where he wants to be. He's where God put him. We have the testimony in 1 Corinthians that if I preach the gospel according to my will, then I deserve a reward. But if I'm doing this against my will, then, then all I can say is that a stewardship, a dispensation, a responsibility uh, for the gospel has been committed unto me. And, and one has to keep that in mind so that we don't make Paul much more than he really is. I call God as a witness upon my life. Look at the life of Paul. Uh, what, what had God done for him as far as materialism was concerned? Well, not a lot. He, he devastated his life as far as his peace and joy and assurance were concerned. You know, what a dramatic difference that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth. He says, I have no idea what the believers of Corinth thought it might be, but the purpose in the delaying of the visit of Paul was to spare them. Uh, not that any apostle had lordship over their faith. The believers at Corinth did not stand or fall according to their own faith. Not that we're exercising any lordship over your faith, but we are co-workers with you in your joy. Your Bible says, for by faith you stand. Uh, the word by there is, it is not there in the original text. It is saying, for in faith you absolutely stand. The word is a perfect tense. Uh, as far as modern Christianity is concerned, the standing or, or the falling of a believer is according to the su success of his own life uh, and the problems of the present moment. But it's never that way in the Word of God. The Word here is perfect. There is no idea of, of vacillation in their standing. There's no idea of doubt in their standing. Uh, this is a positional truth. It's how we positionally stand before God. And I think it's imperative that we continue to remind ourselves of the setting of 1st and 2nd Corinthians because they look so much like us. Now many would argue that, well, Steve, we're not, our church isn't carnal or, you know. The purpose of 2nd Corinthians is suffering and love. It'll be the recurring theme in 2nd Corinthians. There's, there is suffering in every chapter but one. And love in almost every chapter. It's an easy thing, folks, for the Christian to look at his life and what he does and, and come to the conclusion that God couldn't possibly love me, you know, or, or God used to love me, but you know, he doesn't anymore. Paul started out saying that he was a sinner, and he wound up late in his life saying he was the chief of sinners. It's not that he became a worse and worse sinner the long, longer he lived, but that I believe that he sinned against more and more light the longer that he lived. And it seems foreign to human logic that God could continue to love a continual sinner when the truth is God's love doesn't depend on how well one of his children behaves. The, the carnal mind would lead us to believe, the fleshly mind would have us believe that, that one is a sinner 
he finds that he's redeemed by the grace of God and he quits sinning and he's now one who used to be a sinner, uh, redeemed by the grace of God, and he now lives a better and a better, better life. In fact, if God would just let him live a little bit longer, he'd reach a state equal to God. You know, there'd, there'd be some time where he, you know, he could walk into heaven and he could say, you know, God, I don't know how long it took you, but, I, you know, I made it also. Move over. I'll help you judge the rest of these people. And, and I admit that it's perfectly logical that once we're redeemed, we ought to get better and better and better. But... Folks, you have an issue to deal with. The new man can't get any better. What is apparent is that the grace of God is just as necessary many years after we recognize our redemption in Christ as, as it is the moment that we recognize that redemption. And I think you've, that you've missed a tremendous truth if you look at 1 and 2 Corinthians as the product of the mind of the Apostle Paul who wrote to a group of naughty people in Corinth. But, if you see First and Second Corinthians as a revelation of the grace of God as He deals with His children, it's interesting that in First Corinthians we have the only reference of the children of Israel in the wilderness. I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning our fathers, that they were all under the cloud and they were all baptized in the sea and in the cloud and they all were baptized into Moses. They all ate the same spiritual food and they all drank the same spiritual drink. And human logic has led us to believe that scriptural truth is a group of Israelites be beginning on a wilderness journey toward heaven, and some of them make it and some of them don't. But if we make the attitude and the actions throughout the wanderings in the wilderness, if we make that the basis of whether or not they entered into heaven, which, which we define to be the promised land or, or, the, or the promised land which we define to be heaven, then we're led into a horrible and, and, in my opinion, a blasphemous area. The truth of the matter is that God redeemed His people when they didn't anticipate it, they didn't ask for it, they didn't expect it, and that when He redeemed them, He led them forth from the grave bound uh, hand and foot with grave clothes. He didn't need to do that. And they walked in the wilderness in a walk of suffering, to be sure. There was a cloud there that shielded them from the heat of the day. There was a fire that shielded them from the cold of the night. You know, it gets pretty cold in that desert at night and quite hot in the daytime. And folks, that is true in your life. You came out redeemed, but you came out bound hand and, and foot with grave clothes, and God constantly shields you from the wrath of judgment and warns you uh, to trust Him, not yourself, and He warms you from the chill of broken fellowship and communion. And they walked in suffering and difficulty. Few of them made the promised land. You know, few being defined as two. And I suggested to you that when we were in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that I'm not at all certain whether one is allowed to carry that percentage into that today, but I reached the conclusion that it must be pretty much the same. You know, two out of, well, some say half a million or more entered into rest. Rest. 
God defines the promised land for us in Hebrews. It's, it's not heaven. It's rest. And the truth is that today there are few Christians who really enter into rest and peace with God. And it is a labor. We labor to enter into that rest. The disturbing thought for those of you who may be the Caleb's and the Joshua's is that you know you have to walk along with the rest of us. Even though you may have entered into his rest long before us. You got to walk along until we drop out or we enter in. The promised land is not heaven, folks, at all, but rest. What I see in 1 Corinthians is a picture of the disobedience, the, the carnality, the loss, the foolishness of the children of Israel in the wilderness. You know, when God told them to enter into the promised land and they looked at the problems involved, they, they didn't have a standing army, they didn't have a a draft they, they didn't have a, they didn't have military weapons they didn't have smart bombs they didn't have nuclear weapons so they knew that there was no way that they could do this the obstacles were insurmountable but what they didn't count on was the greatness of their God and surely, folks, that's true in your life and in mine. The obstacles to rest and to peace and to, to joy in Christ, are the obstacles are insurmountable unless we count on the greatness of our God. So they didn't enter in. And here are believers at Corinth who had not entered into His rest. You know, I've often thought, you know, if I'd been God, I'd have probably left them a long time ago. That's, that's the way they want to be? Fine. Let them go back to Egypt. You know, but, but he didn't do that. That was not his attitude toward the believers at Corinth any more than it was his grace toward the Israelites in the Old Testament. And now we come to 2 Corinthians. You know, we're not we left the first, the first chapter. We're not exercising lordship over your faith. You don't stand or fall to the apostle. You stand or fall to God. We're co-workers with you, and it's by faith that you absolutely stand. No isolation in that standing. It's, it's secure. It's solid. It's enduring forever. One, because it's in Christ. You are hid in Christ with God. And you didn't do the hiding. The, the argument, of course, is, is whether that's your, is that, is that my personal faith in Christ or is that the faithfulness of God? I believe in the context of this passage, it speaks of the enduring faithfulness of the Almighty God and the eternal God who, who established us. You didn't establish yourself. Established us in Christ Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 10, we're told that we are perfected forever by His one sacrifice. And if I'm forced to put an agent on the faith and the standing rather than make it myself, I'd make it God. You know, whether it's my exercise of the faith God gave me or whether it's the faithful endurance and continuance of God, it seems to me that we come to the same inevitable result that it rests upon God, even if it's my exercise of what He gave me. The second chapter appears to be a break, but it isn't. Uh, there's no chapter breaks in the original text. If you'll remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the Holy Spirit says, For I determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now, now that's in the beginning of the second chapter of 1 Corinthians. We've laid out in the first chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians, the greatness of God's grace, the fact that, that He chose them to be His own, 
the fact that he gave them the gifts that they need, uh, the fact that their hope is in him, that, and it's, that it's absolutely secure, uh, and, and we haven't yet entered into any discussion of their car carnality, their fleshly, rotten, filthy behavior, their sin. And in the second chapter, I determined to know nothing among you. I made the judgment, and believe me, it's the Holy Spirit speaking. I made the judgment to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. What I'd really like to do is, is dwell at great length upon some of the, the horror in your individual lives. But, you know, the central theme of this letter is going to be Jesus Christ, His person, and Him crucified. That's His work. So we're looking at His person and His work. And now, interestingly enough, the Holy Spirit, uh, He begins the second chapter of 2 Corinthians. I made the decision, and again, same word, uh, for my own sake, the authorized version says, I determined this with myself. Uh, I determined this with myself. Uh, there was, Paul had a will, okay? Uh, now, that's not what the grammar said. I, I made this decision for my own sake that I would not come again to you in grief. Okay? Now, I have to believe that Paul is a, is a yielded tool of the Holy Spirit. And that what the Holy Spirit is doing for the Corinthians there, it, He's doing for their good. Or all of the theology of the Scriptures break down. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to those who were, are the called according to His purpose. And so it's the moving of the Holy Spirit that delayed the visit of Paul that he wouldn't come again in grief. Did you get that? Or, or since I made you sorry by, by what was written in the first letter, then I face the fact that I have to be made glad I ha or I have to experience joy from the very ones whom I grieved. And when I wrote this same thing unto you, I wrote it, lest when I came, I should have sorrow from them whom I ought to rejoice. In other words, I'd make sorry the very ones I expected to give me joy. Having confidence in you all that my joy is your joy. Well, that, that seems, that seems a, a strange subject in the light of what we know had happened at Corinth. The, the first chapter talked to us quite a bit about suffering. And now we hear quite a bit about joy. His rejoicing was that he had absolute confidence that what was true of him was also true of them. For out of great suffering and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears. Now look at that next expression. Not that ye should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have more abundantly towards you or unto you. The purpose of the, of the first epistle was not to grieve them, not to burden them, but to demonstrate God's love. If you weren't concerned, he'd have, let, he'd have let them go. It was his love for them that led to the message of 1 Corinthians. Verse 5, but if, if any have caused grief, grief he's not, he hath not grieved me, but in part that I may not overcharge you all. I would translate that, 
since one has caused grief, he's not grieved me except as part of the whole body that I might not charge all of you more, more than I should or burden you, more burden all of you more than I should. In other words, it seems as though that the Holy Spirit is saying that the grief that was caused because of something, we're going to put that kind of aside here, we don't know exactly what that was, affects the whole body. And the Holy Spirit here includes Paul as a member of that body. He's grieved me only in as much as I am part of the whole. And I want you to understand that so that you won't be burdened more than you should be. In other words, my grief is no greater than yours. I don't want you burdened more than you should be. Sufficient, sufficient to such a man as this punishment which was inflicted by the many. And folks, I, and I don't know what that was. I think everybody else knows what that was. Or at least a lot of people do. And maybe you do. But I don't. I can say that the overriding majority of Bible students conclude that that's the man who had his father's wife in 1 Corinthians. And in the first epistle of Corinthians, the believers at Corinth, they got together and as a body of believers, they, they excommunicated the guy. I, I guess that's the word I ought to use. And as a result of that excommunication, he apparently repented uh, apparently he confessed and, and he's now urged in this epistle, they're urging them to take him back, take, take him back into full fellowship. If we make all those conclusions, then we can force this passage to fit that and that may in fact be the case. Uh, there are those who say that if you don't reach that conclusion, then well, nothing here makes a lick of sense. Now, it seems to me that the Holy Spirit left it as vague as it is so that you and I might reach the conclusion that the body of, of believers ought to develop an attitude toward open sin that is scripturally consistent. We are not to fellowship with those living in open sin. We're to withdraw ourselves from any brother who refuses to work, and if he and if he and if he will not work, uh, let him not eat. That's I think that's speak, practically speaking. That's in the practical sense. Uh, uh, let him not eat food, but I believe that the scriptural exhortation is is also that he he doesn't feast on spiritual truth in fellow in the in fellowship of the body of believers. There are exhortations in the Word of God to withdraw and to separate ourselves from Christians. All of those are on moral grounds. Moral grounds. That should include those who are unruly and cause division. But none of those are, are strictly on doctrinal grounds. You are counseled to separate yourselves from unbelievers. But for those who are believers, if they just happen to differ with your doctrine, you're not to separate yourselves on doctrinal ground unless the person becomes unruly. You know, there are, there are rules uh, in the church. Uh, things should be done decently and in order. But a break in fellowship between two Christians is not as much on doctrinal grounds, but on moral grounds and that sin rebuked before all. And I believe that the exhortation is as vague as it is in this passage so that we don't just put in one experience in 1 Corinthians and say, well, you know, all the, rest, all the others were all okay. I admit that the context here seems to put it on one man. You know, could this be the one man who had his father's wife? Well, I don't know. 
Could it be the one man that insisting upon his own rights? Could it be the one man coming and breaking bread in an unworthy or uh, unfaithful manner and so forth? You know, could it be the one man who's going before uh, carnal judges, worldly judges, rather than submit to a situation where, you know, we're working in love and understanding with uh, other believers? I think we're looking at a breaking of fellowship because of open sin. And, and I believe that's what it is. If any man who is called a brother be a fornicator and so forth, we're not to eat with such a one. We're not to fellowship with such a one. But the text, folks, calls him a brother. The fact is, he's a brother. The fact is that he's redeemed. The fact is that he does stand perfectly because of his position in Christ. And that's what happens between you and the Savior. Or you and another believer. Your position in Christ Jesus doesn't change. But breaks in fellowship do come. Your communion with Christ breaks till the heart cries out, Restore me the joy of my youth. Restore me the joy of my deliverance. Restore my peace. Restore my fellowship. And Paul, and keep in mind, this is not Paul's logic. Paul, God through Paul, God's the one speaking here. It's His Word. He considers that break of fellowship as sufficient punishment. Sufficient, horizontal punishment, not judgment. It's a break of fellowship. And that's, that's enough as far as God is concerned. Therefore, you ought to forgive Him and comfort Him. Uh, we know how to comfort, right? Uh, boy, you shouldn't have done that, man. Remember when you did that? Wasn't that terrible what you did? You know, how, how is that comforting, folks? You ought to forgive Him. And implicit in the word forgive is the idea of not bringing it up, ever bringing it up, or even remembering it anymore. That's not a very easy thing to do. You know, that person's a terrible person. They ought to be reminded of that over and over and over again. You know, I'd never do anything like that. Forgiven, folks, so that it's forgotten lest they be swallowed up with much sorrow. Much excessive sorrow. God isn't highlighting the danger of you doing the same thing that your brother did, but the need that the both of you have to forgive one another, not, not bite and devour one another. You know, you might say, you know, you know, feasting on yourselves instead of feasting on Christ. God has sovereignly placed us in this area, this wilderness in which we walk. And in the greatness of our Lord's communion uh, with the Father, our Lord said, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them in the world. And the perfect tenses of the word stand in verse 24 of chapter 1 is simply another incidental indication of that keeping power. But we're looking now at the communion, the fellowship that's in that world system that He didn't take us out of. It is possible for a believer to be swallowed up with so much sorrow, too much sorrow. Thirty years ago, the Lord led me to the mission field and I refused to go and my life's been ruined ever since. You know, and the attitude there is a direct refusal to believe what this book says. You are absolutely secure in Christ. You will never perish. You absolutely stand because of God's great faithfulness. You will spend all eternity in glory with Him because of the greatness of His grace towards you. What, what God has left open for you and for me here 
is a walk of fellowship and communion with Him Therefore, confirm your love toward Him. Folks, if you don't love fornicators and adulterers and murderers and robbers and those who bear false witness, and you can go on down the list, if, if you don't love them, folks, folks, then you don't love the people of God. If you want to know what a Christian can do, then simply read in Ephesians what he shouldn't do. I mean, it's an impressive list. You know, lie not uh, one to another, seeing you put off the old man with his deeds. Uh, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Let him that stole steal no more. And on and on the exhortations go. Are, are they written to non-believers so that they might, by, by virtue of these things, become believers? Well, of course not. No, they're written to you, and they're written to me. They're written to redeemed people, and yet you hear what you hear today is redeemed people. They don't do those. No, they don't do those things. It's hard to love people that do those things, but the people that do those things, folks, are the people of God. Law, flesh, human merit in the body of Christ. It rips and it tears apart whatever fellowship that there is. We are to forgive and comfort one another. I'm not suggesting that you become presumptuous with God. What the Scriptures are saying here is that sufficient is the breaking of fellowship. And when you know one sees repentance and when one sees an expression of the love of God, then there should be restoration and comfort. I think it's confirming God's love for him, for this person. We're to be the vessels through which the love of God is revealed, but I think we are seeing a confirmation of the love of God for that individual. God is expressing His will for us here through Paul. For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you whether you're yielded in all things. You know, if the, if the man really did repent and you're unwilling to comfort him and to do that in the presence of the love of God, then are you folks not, are you not in fact the greater offender? Why did the Holy Spirit write these epistles at all? The Holy Spirit is using Paul as, as the, our example here. Verse 10, If you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. And if I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven it in the presence of Christ for your sake. Verse 11, in order that Satan should not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes or his devices. You and I both know that Satan's force, his power has been annulled. We, we read in Hebrews that God destroyed him, but the word destroyed means to annul doesn't mean to annihilate, but annul. Make, make it of no effect. His power is of no effect. What are his devices? You know, well, the easiest thing to, su is to, su to suggest is that Satan, well, he'd like to take you to hell with him and, and that what he's working to do right now is overthrow your, your, your redemption and, and send you to hell rather than heaven. I think one would be foolish not to see the hand of Satan in, in many of the experiences of the children of Israel in the wilderness. We're told that he goes around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Are we to look at that 11th verse and say that his devices are directed against this one man who's repented and that, and that, you, won't, that you won't receive him back? in fellowship and, and, and confirm 
the love of God toward him? Or, or is it possibly that what Satan would like to do is drive a wedge between the revelation of the Word of God and the body of Christ? I'm going to close there with verse 11. Uh, the Lord, Lord willing, will continue next week. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.